Well, welcome back to another episode of the Financially Free Journey podcast, and I'm your host, Courtney Dyer. Today, I am so excited to be welcoming on not just one guest, guys, but two guests, and we are international. We have Juan in Houston, and Julio is in Spain, and I'm so excited to have them on the show. They are actually uh, chief investment officers, and uh, they are financial experts and really have fantastic backgrounds and accolades when it comes to the financial industry, economics, investing, everything you can think of. And I'm going to let them expand and tell you guys a little bit more about themselves. But today we're going to be talking about behavioral economics, the psychology of investing, investing, financial planning. I mean, today we're going to we're going to cover it all, guys. So you're going to want to make sure you stay tuned in to the very end. So welcome on the show, guys. How are you doing? We're good. good. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Yes, I'm so excited for you to be here. So Expand a little bit on your background for the listeners, just so they have a little better understanding of um, what it is that you guys do. Sure. So uh, Julio and myself, uh, we run two companies in Houston, Texas. One of them is called Inscription Capital. The other is Quantor Capital. Inscription is an investment advisor where we help families, um, individuals, and institutions with their financial investments, with their investments overall, their financial planning. Um, and then Quantro Capital is an asset manager that manages two, two investment funds, uh, fund vehicles. Um, we met in New York, actually, in 2014. I used to run a hedge fund and used to try to actually uh, sell my hedge fund to Julio's ex-employee. That never was successful. He was the gatekeeper there. He was their head of risk. And uh, we became friends there, though, and he moved to Houston, and we cre- we created this uh, th- this journey of Quantra Capital and Inscription Capital that uh, that's, that's that's led to us today. So, um, my background a little bit is I went to the University of Texas in Austin. I'm a native Houstonian, and um, and have been in my in the career uh, in investing for 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 all my life, actually. Um, Julio, you want to jump in there a little bit? Yes. So uh, my background is um, I have a PhD in economics from Princeton University. I specialized in uh, portfolio construction, optimal portfolio construction. Uh, I, w- I have worked in, uh, in the finance industry also all my life. Uh, I work in New York for uh, a large family office. And then I moved to Houston. I teach at Rice University Finance. Um, asset pricing, risk management, uh, and I work and I am the CIO at uh, at Inscription Capital, and I am partner with Juan Carlos at uh, Quantor Capital. So when I say earlier, when I said it earlier that you guys have uh, a lot of accolades, I really meant it. I mean, the fact that you guys are so knowledgeable and experienced in the finance industry is just a great great uh, thing for the the listeners to know, because again, the expertise and the information that you're going to share today is going to be phenomenal for them to be able to take it back and to put into action in their own lives. So guys, I want to, I want to cut to the meat and potatoes here. Let's talk about why most people make bad investment decisions. So here's the thing, you know, I think we haven't done a a great job, not, not only in the U.S., but I think across the world in, in really um, educating the masses um, when it comes to personal finance and personal finance choices. And a lot of the mistakes that are made in investing um, are, are, are repeated throughout, throughout history. They're not new. They're, they're, they're behavioral mistakes. They're, 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 they're these intuitions that we have as human beings, it, it almost gets to our gambling nature because a lot of the times what we have, especially the, this fear of missing out, this FOMO, um, how, it's, how it's called, um, really gets to us because, you know, I'll make, it, I'll make very clear examples right now, you know, with, with cryptocurrencies or with uh, yes. Tesla or with things like this. Um, the fear of missing out um, really hits home that if you're not on that train and you're not in there and you keep seeing the price go up and up and up, you're going to be feel, you're going to be feel like you're going to be the only person without any money and everyone else will be rich. And, and it even gets worse when we actually look at our friends. It's actually found that when our friends are actually making money in something 
um, and we're not, that creates the FOMO even, even worse. Like, you know, that's, that's the trigger point really for most of us, right? When we have someone very close to us that are, that are invested in it. But when we take a step back and you realize that um, in the long run, okay, this is where the empirical evidence comes in. The empirical evidence basically is like everything that's been published in the academic journals that has been studied in, in the data-driven science of investing. Um, the conclusion is that in the long run, um, 97% of investors will fail to outperform the market. Okay. Wow. So there's a lot of reasons why we can get into that, but just because of these, and this isn't in a new finding, this is actually a finding that has been consistent going back to the sixties. Um, the, the investment professional industry is not going to really announce this that much because then they won't have a job <laughs> if people know, know this. And so what this tells us though, is that if you know this fact, then you know that in the long run, whoever's making a lot of money today in crypto, whoever's making a lot of money today in whatever, um, chances are that there's going to be a reversion to the mean. And in the long run, they're not going to be able to even outperform the market. So you should probably just ignore that and be, have a more disciplined approach to, to, to what to do with your money in investing. Well, what I find so interesting about that concept, Juan, is we know that uh, if you're not investing with emotions that you want to, with anything in life, you want to buy low and then sell high, right? But what most investors do is actually the complete opposite, right? They buy when it's already high. And then as soon as it dips and starts losing value, they get scared and they sell when it's low. So we actually end up doing the complete opposite of what we know we should be doing, which is so interesting when it comes to the psychology behind investing. Well, I mean, if you think about it, what does it mean to buy low and to buy high, right? In relation to what? To the previous day's price. But what if the previous day's price was expensive? You don't really know if it's expensive or cheap going forward in time, right? right. And so that's the complicated part, right? It's like, oh, well, if it, if it goes down, then buy it. And, and then if it goes up, then, 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 then you just sell it. And it's that, it's that simple. And I'm like, yeah, but the data, <laughs> the data shows us that we we suck at that. <laughs> like, we're right. not, like, said, like we're not good at doing that. And it's precisely because we don't know how much higher something can go or how much lower something can go from the moment we do buy it. Right. Do you think it has to do with uh, not understanding basic fundamentals, like perhaps the PE ratio and not knowing whether a stock is overvalued at that time? Right. Because a lot of times optimism is priced into, you know, a stock. And so, you know, as you said, the hype with your friends and your family and then the price keeps going up. Do you feel like that plays a major role in that as well? I mean, yeah, look, I think the P, all the statistics that the, 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 the PE ratio, the sharp ratio, or, 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 or any way you can analyze a company, what you have to, you have to take a step back and, and, and know that we live in a competitive world. And so I think what people forget when they go and make an investment, or especially when they go buy a stock or a bond, is that that information of that company in, in, is available to everyone on planet Earth, Okay. So you're not, you don't have privileged information because you know the PE ratio. There's lots of people out there that have that same information. So what ends up happening is that we fail to realize the competitiveness, the competitive nature of the market, right? Where the market is actually pricing in all available information immediately in real time, every second. So right. as soon as information comes out, people look at the information and react and they're either buyers or sellers. And so the prices continuously change. So I would say the hardest thing is, that, we're, that we oversee isn't so much that we're not knowledgeable about the data and how to interpret the data. It's more about the competitive nature and the efficiency of the market itself. You know, um, that's really what we failed to miss. A lot of times we don't realize that when we buy a stock, there's, there's actually someone on the other side buying it from us, <laughs> right? It's, yeah. like, it's not just a button that you press on Robinhood and all of a sudden you own Tesla. Someone sold that to you, right? There's an exchange in there. Um, it's just that it, we've, we've managed, I think in a way also, you know, for better or worse to, you know, because of technology to gamify investing in a way where, you know, we treat it like a video game sometimes Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's not meant to be that way, but you know, on the one hand, it's great because it gives people access to the markets, but on the other hand, it might be causing some damage because we treat it like a game and at the end of the money, it's real money. <laughs> that we're, right. That we're so, okay, we know that there's a 97% chance that as an investor, we are going to fail to outperform the stock market. So for the listeners that aren't as familiar or confident with investing, what should they do with their hard-earned money? What's the next step for them? Um, I mean, given the facts, 
which is that uh, most people risk adjusted cannot outperform a market, which could be a stock market, a bond market, commodity market, any market. Uh, the key is that most investors are not, are not going to be able to outperform, adjusted by risk, any of these markets. So if that's the case, then as an investor, what you should try to do is to replicate the markets, not try to outperform them, Instead of trying to outperform them, try to replicate them at the lowest cost that you can. So that will be the way to go. So you replicate a market using um, inexpensive uh, index funds, for example, that replicate a market. That, that will be one way to do it. For most people, uh, for the average investor, that will be enough to do that. Now, you have people that are more or less risk tolerant or volatility tolerant. If you are extremely risk averse, so maybe you want to have more money in cash than, try, than replicating all the markets. Now, if you are a person that you are uh, extremely risk tolerant, like an entrepreneur, for example, um, like a gambler, uh, like a risk taker, uh, then maybe what you want to do is to replicate the markets and then use leverage to obtain higher expected returns. That doesn't mean that you're going to outperform. It only means that you're taking more risk, but because you're taking more volatility or more risk, you should expect higher returns in the future. So it's that that's what people have to do. ratio, right, Julio? It's the risk-reward ratio and making sure that that's in line. If you're going to take additional risk, you have to make sure that the reward aligns with that. And so I think that's really critical for the listeners to understand is, uh, again, I love how you said to replicate the market uh, instead of trying to outperform the market and then really understanding your your tolerance, your risk, and if the reward matches you know, the risk that you're taking. Right. Uh, actually, there are like three main facts in finance that we know, that passes the scientific method, which are one is the one that Juan Carlos mentioned, which is that most investors in the long run do not outperform the market. So that's one fact. The other fact is what you what you just said, which is uh, that risk and expected return are linked. What that means is that. If you don't want to take risk, you should expect low returns. That's, that's a very uh, a basic principle and something that we observe. Now, if you want to obtain high expected returns, then you need to take more risk. What this means is that it's very unlikely to find free lunch. What do I mean by free lunch? That will mean that you find an asset that has low risk and can give you and will have a um, expectation of giving you extremely high returns. Now, are you starting a new business and you might be concerned about using your personal number? Well, for less than 13 bucks per user, you can get a business line with Flex Plans. This is the all new business phone plan by Virtual PBX. Flex Plans provides unlimited calling, business texting, video conferencing, all for entrepreneurs that need a way to connect with their customers. And it includes a free soft phone, uh, plus it includes two free local toll-free numbers, a virtual receptionist, professional greetings, call forwarding, voicemail text, and just so much more. So right now you can save 15% by visiting virtualpbx.com slash podcast. Now that's less than $13 per user for your business business line. So separate your private line from your professional line today by visiting virtualpbx.com slash podcast. So those are the type of assets that we call free launch. And what empirical evidence says is that it's extremely difficult to find those assets. The third 
fact is that uh, not all the risks are the same. So if you want higher expected returns, you need to take a lot of risk. But that doesn't mean that you need to take any risk. Not all the risks are the same. For example, if you go to a casino, your expected return actually is negative. Um, the, the, the casinos are in favor of the house. There's a small probability that the house will win in the long run. So the expected return for the, for the, for the player is negative. So the, the, the gambler that goes to a casino has a negative expectation. Um, so it's taking risk, but it's not going to be compensated for that risk. Um, however, there are risks that you get compensated for. These type of risks are called systematic risks. For example, if you invest in a well-diversified portfolio, let's say a stock market um, uh, portfolio, that portfolio will have systematic risk because it's going to correlate with the economic cycle or with expectations about the economic cycle. So because of that, because you are a provider of liquidity to the market, you are going to get compensated for that because you're going to be able to buy um, uh, to a lower value than the expected return. So those assets or those portfolios, you get, you, you can expect to get compensated. And that's why I'm saying that not all the risks are the same because sometimes people believe that if they invest in one company, just one simple company, for example, if they start uh, a company or if they invest in a startup, they think they're gonna get high returns because they're taking a lot of risk. But that might not be the case. Absolutely. Well, it's really understanding the difference, as you mentioned, Julio, between systematic and unsystematic risk, and not all risk is created equal. So understanding what your risk appetite is, and if the reward that you're expecting, and again, it's never guaranteed, but it's better than letting your money burn with inflation in the bank, right? So we know we've got to do something with our money. So we need to understand what type of reward we're expecting in return. And I'm sure you guys have experienced this where you have clients that ask you, well, you know what? I don't want a lot. I, I want l full liquidity. Uh, I don't want a lot of risk, but I'm expecting like a five or 6% return. Right. And you're like, well, I, you know, <laughs> that's just not feasible. So really understanding, um, proper expectations in balancing that. Yeah, that's, that's crucial, right? That's the, and that comes in again with the first thing I said, you know, during the podcast, which is there's just, you don't know what you don't know. Right. At the end of the day, if I walked into a, you know, to Apple headquarters and um, all of a sudden someone's told, told me, hey, what do you think of the M1 chips processing unit? I, I don't know. Right. Again, I, I might have my theories. I might have my wants. I might have my experiences with the computer. But again, I don't know. And I think because we all have money or we all make money or that's the goal in life in a way to, you know, since you're born, you go to school to try to make money. But we don't really get taught much about money. <laughs> and so I think there is a gap between that, right? Between by the time we start working and, and making money and seeing how, how, how do we translate that into, into a skill set? Because oh, that's a very common question, you know, Courtney, that people ask that, you know, um, I, I don't want any risk, but I want to make 10% returns. <laughs> but, like, if they all simple, want that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you understand the simple concept of risk and reward, right? And how this is like, you know, a fact almost in, in you know, it is a fact in, in, in financial theory, then that question shouldn't arise that much, right? Because then you should always question that if someone is giving you an investment that it says, I got the best investment, it pays you 20%, right? And no risk. An, an alarm bell should immediately go off in your head saying, either one, that person doesn't know the risks and he's, he's being truthful with me, but he's just, he just doesn't know the risks himself, or two, this is a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> ding, right? ding, ding, ding. Exactly. <laughs> and so these alarm bells can be triggered better in all of us by just kind of understanding those three simple concepts, I think, that Julio just, just talked about right now. 
I love that because again, we're not saying, you know what, you need to be an, a complete expert in the field in order to invest, but to have a great foundation underneath you, understanding basic concepts. So then that way you can make really informed, confident decisions when it comes to investing your money. A question that I had for you that, that I just thought about too is, you know, we, we've talked about risk reward and how critical that is, but there's also different strategies and styles when it comes to investing. So as an investor, if I've never heard of this before, can you guys just briefly explain what the difference is between active and passive investments? So that way the listeners can say, oh yeah, you know what? I want to be an active or a passive investor. So um, I'll start off by saying that all the empirical evidence says that you should not be an active investor. <laughs> just, just I'm just going to come out like, like that and say that. You're just um, going to drop that bomb I'm on us. Drop that right there. <laughs> so, so the difference basically is what Julio was saying that a passive investor looks to replicate the markets for, in the most efficient way possible, and the active investor is looking to outperform the markets. And the only way to outperform the markets is to deviate from the market, right? So you're you're trying to pick the winners and losers from the whole market itself. So if I showed you, here's the 9,000 largest companies on planet Earth, right? Google, Apple, Facebook, all the Chinese companies, everything. The passive investor would go and say, okay, I just want to replicate that. And how you replicate it is you actually have to assign a, a weight to all the companies in according to their size. So you have to, you have to, what's called market cap weight, all of the companies, right? And then, then you get your index of the world, right? Now, now you own the world, <laughs> the world equities, an active investor is going to take that same universe, but they they might only pick 50 stocks out of the 9,000 or 20 or 100 or one, right? And that's what an active investor does. The active investor is trying to pick which ones he thinks will be better than the market as a whole. And what all of the empirical evidence tells us is that we are, ext we are, we are very bad at this. Now, the reason we're bad at this is not that difficult to understand once you understand these, the, what I'm about to say. Uh, there, there's two or three main reasons, but but one, the most important reason to understand is that people fail to realize that this is a zero sum game. If the market return of the stock market, let's say, but this applies to any market, but if the market return is 10%, let's say the market went up 10%, what does that mean? That means that the average of everyone in that market went up 10%. That's the average. It's the middle. So if you look at a bell curve, if you can, if you can imagine a bell curve, right? And right in the middle of the bell, there's a line right smack in the middle. That's going to that's gonna separate the people who have outperformed the market and the people who have underperformed the market in one observation. So the bell in the middle, the line in the middle is going to separate. So you have 50% of the people that are outperform and 50% that will underperform to create the average of 10% that I said, right? That, that's a mathematical certainty that has to happen. What it's saying is that for every person that outperforms the market, someone has to underperform it by the exact same amount because that's the market average. Now, the moment you add costs to the equation, you know, expense ratios, trading costs, advisory fees, yada, 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 all the costs, the line is no longer in the middle. It shifts over to the left. So now you have a minority, let's call it 30 or 40% of the people that outperform, and the majority, 70%, are underperforming. But here's, what, here's where it gets even more interesting. That's only one observation, right? When this plays out over and over and over again throughout time, that 30 or 40% that outperformed the evidence also tells us that they're not persistent. They're not the same people in different observations. They keep switching. It keeps being like 30 or 40 people, 30 or 40%, but they're not the same ones. So the ones that are left keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to this 97%, right? That, that end up not performing. And that's what happens. And so that's why I think it's important to know that from start from, I don't think it's a debate. It, it, it's it's kind of like climate change. Like it's not a debate. <laughs> like it's like, it's a fact. <laughs> like you, should, right. you know, it, it's a fact that in the long run, active investors will fail to outperform the market. So if you had a choice to be an active investor or passive, definitely go the passive route. Okay. So what's your hot take on the fad of day trading right now? Because it seems like it has become more and more prevalent that there's these discord groups and everybody's selling a course to learn how to, you know, day trade and, and, you know, make a hundred thousand dollars a day or, or whatever the claims are. And it, you know, it seems like in the last five years, even it has become much more prevalent than previously. What's your, what's your take on that? So I mean, again, this isn't this isn't something new, right? I mean, we've seen this. If you know, if you if you if if you study the history of investors and and the and the behavior of investors going back hundreds of years, 
there's always been periods of time where this euphoria takes over, right? And then everyone is claiming to be an expert of whatever, you know, in the 1920s, it was a nine year bull market where, you know, taxi cab drivers would tell people that they made so much money yesterday in the next railroad stock. And then, you know, and then in the 1950s, you had the nifty 50. You always have these times and these periods in the 2000s, you had the incredible internet bubble that, you know, I recently saw a PBS frontline documentary that was filmed in 1997, where they were interviewing people in 1997 about, you know, how they felt about the stock market. And it's very similar to today. We just forget about the 2008 moments, right? We forget about, because it's so long ago, or we forget that the 2001s, that, that, that these things can happen and, and the markets might not bounce back immediately, right? They might stay low for much longer than you can stay solvent. So, you know, this is natural. I think that the, the, this is nothing new and surprising. Um, I will say that the evidence, this is like a casino. It's like what Julio was saying, the, the expected probabilities of you being successful doing that are very low. It doesn't mean you won't be. I mean, there might be some people that just get extremely lucky, right? And then they'll be very rich um, by doing this. But in the vast majority, they won't. Right. right. Because again, are you a part of the 3% or the 97%? I mean, we would all like to be a part of the 3%, but how likely is that? And so, yeah, you know, and again, with social media, things are much more uh, easily accessible information. So it seems to be more prevalent now. But as you said, Juan Carlos, it's like, it's always been like this. The market is cyclical. We have these bull runs uh, and the market will correct and then we'll have a bull run again. And so as an investor to be passive and to have long-term holds, really is the name of the game. Am I, am I getting that right? Yeah. And again, I understand the need to do it because it's hard. It, it goes back to that fear of missing out emotion, right? And so it's, it's, it's when you see a lot of people around you or an expert on YouTube saying that they got rich and if you do their course, then you can get rich too. Um, just step back for a second and realize, look, what are the incentives here? Does that person really want you to become rich or does he want you to buy his $30 of course. He well, and, and, take, and course. take a step back and realize he's standing next to his rented Lamborghini. You know exactly. what I mean? Just take a step back. So, <laughs> and not only that, right? Like a lot of times people will ask me, well, you know, the expert on CNBC or Forbes magazine said that there's a, good, a lot of inflation coming or that this is going to happen or that that's going to happen. I'm like, look, again, take a step back. If someone actually knew what the future was going to be, right? And they were certain about it. Do you actually think that they were going to be screaming it from the top of their lungs on television? If you know anything about investing, you know that the most precious thing that you can have in investing is an edge. So if you have privileged information that you know the future, you're going to keep quiet. You're going to mortgage your house. You're going to leverage to the wazoo and you're going to make that bet yourself and not tell anyone <laughs> and make right. all the money. And right. so that's why I think people forget about this, right? It's like the media and the, and the financial media, especially is entertainment. It's good entertainment. It, there's nothing of value that you're going to get from it. All right. There's nothing. <laughs> no one has a crystal ball. No one knows what's going to happen in the future. It is impossible if you were sitting in 2019 summer to say, oh, COVID is going to hit in 2021. And we're going to have a recession in the first quarter and second quarter of 2020. Who, who, who could predict that? No one. <laughs> And that's why long-term holding periods, again, because as we talked about, the market is cyclical. You cannot predict future events. But if you look at the averages of the market over the last 100 plus years, the averages are there and the empirical evidence is there. And so that's so critical to go back to and say, yeah, you know, you may know people that made a million dollars on AMC or GameStop or Dogecoin or whatever the newest fad is, but there's always a new fad. And the prudent long-term investor, it's like the 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 hare, the rabbit and the, the hare, right? Or the turtle, whatever the, the comparison is. It's like slow and steady wins the race. And now a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is presented by Early Bird. Now, Early Bird is the simplest way for parents, family, and friends to collectively invest in a child's financial future, starting at the earliest age. Early Bird's mobile app empowers parents and families to start saving for their child's financial future in matter of minutes while activating a child's broader community to gift contributions on birthdays, holidays, and really any occasion. We're teaming up with Early Bird to give our listeners a free $15 investment to give to a child that you love. So you just have to go to partners.getearlybird.io slash podcast, and I will link that in the show notes. 
You're going to download the app and create an account today. Early Bird will help you build the nest and invest in the children's lives that you love. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And then also, I'll just add to that too, you know, the it's boring to do the right thing. And I get it, right? You know, the 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 it's kind of like dieting, right? Like we all kind of know how to lose weight, right? It's like don't eat as much and go do exercise. It's a simple formula. But right. yet, why is it so hard for us to do that, right? It's because of the temptations. The temptations around us in, in the food and the, in the wine with our, with our friends and the party. And, the, you know, there's all these temptations always around us that, that's hard to stay the course, right? Investing is very similar. The formula is pretty simple. It's not that complicated, right? It's like just, we, we just, we're just distracted by all the temptations out there. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. And and going with your diet analogy, it's like if you have a good plan in place prior to starting your diet and you know that there's going to be those obstacles and there's going to be bread at the dinner table and there's going to be that wine or whatever, you've planned for it, right? Uh, and you've, you've really set yourself up for success that way. So, okay, we've talked about the 97% passive versus active uh, and really understanding the risk reward ratios. What would you give as some solid advice to the listeners on steps that they can take right now to get started with investing? Because that seems to be the hardest barrier to break when you have never invested before to take that first step. Um, so based on what we have said, uh, the first step is to do it as soon as possible. Invest as soon as you can. The earlier you do it, the more time you have for your returns to compound over time. So the best way is to start right away. Now, what are the steps really? You need to have a, a, a brokerage account. So you need to work with a broker. Uh, an electronic broker will be best because they are inexpensive. Nowadays, many of these uh, brokers do not charge uh, custodian fees. They don't charge you for uh, buying uh, ETFs, for example. Um, so it's quite inexpensive to have uh, a brokerage account. And once you have that brokerage account, uh, you need to understand your goals. So uh, you need to understand when do you want that money. Um, if it's for the long term, maybe you can take more volatility than is for the short term. So once you understand your goals, when do you need the money? Then you can start asking yourself about your risk tolerance. Uh, how much volatility are you willing to take? Uh, for the average investor, they will be willing to take the market volatility. Uh, so for those investors, what they need really to, to do is to search for an e for a index fund that invests in most of the assets in the world uh, that tries to replicate the market of those assets, and then just buy that that um, that index fund and hold it uh, for whenever they will need their money. Uh, now, uh, financial planning is maybe they will need the help of uh, an expert uh, to really uh, to, to really plan in detail um, when do they need the money, uh, how to separate in different portfolios maybe their, 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 their investments. Uh, but the general view is open a brokerage account, invest as soon as you can, use index funds that replicate most of uh, um, abroad um, a broad market like the stock market. Um, and basically that's it. I mean, as simple as that. As we, we always, we tend to try to overcomplicate things that we feel are complex or intimidating. And it's a, almost a, a way for us to avoid taking the necessary steps to get started because it's scary. And so uh, a follow-up question that I have for you guys is you had mentioned, you know, you can go to an online brokerage account. You can, you know, that's generally uh, less, you know, fees involved. 
And then you may have to look at soliciting the expert of uh, the advice of an expert later on. So when do you, you know, de- do it yourself versus uh, solicit the advice of an expert? Is there a, a dollar amount? I mean, when do you suggest they, they make that, that change? Um, well, look, the, the research and we're kind of preaching here because that's what we do, but there is research on this that says that because most people are not able to handle the volatility of the markets themselves because, you know, it's one thing to buy a house and never see the price move every day as to buy something that you see the price move up and down. So for for mainly behavioral reasons, people I think are better off hiring a a professional advisor to help them with. And, And more than anything, that person shouldn't be someone who's pushing a product or telling you about the next sexy investment um, it should be someone that tells you exactly what Julio did, but is there as a coach with you throughout the journey, right? It's, it's, it's another, it's a pair of ears that, oh my God, coronavirus hit and the stock market's down 30%. You can call them. Hey, is everything okay? Is the world literally going to end? And this, this, this may seem like not a lot of value add, but trust me, it is a lot of value add because especially when you do it yourself, you can go out there and pick the index fund that's going to replicate all the stocks in the world um, but are you going to be able to stick with it and hold it throughout the lifespan? And there's a lot of research that says that people don't because they're not really understanding what they're buying. Right? Well, someone to talk you off the ledge, right? And most financial advisors as well, and I think this is really critical for the listeners to understand, is they have a higher value proposition than just getting you into you know, an index fund. They are going to help you take a holistic view of your goals and your finances and your assets and your liabilities and your tax liability and help you sufficiently plan for the future to mitigate a lot of those risks or expenses that may occur. Her. And so that's a huge part of, I would say, hiring a financial advisor. And do you guys have any questions that the listeners should maybe ask a financial advisor if they're considering hiring one? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, I, would, I would start off by asking the financial advisor what their investment philosophy is if they don't have one. Um, if they just say um, that they you know, pick the best mutual funds that, that probably want to look elsewhere. Um, I think it's very important for an, a financial advisor to actually have an investment philosophy that they can explain very clearly and thoughtful to someone. Um, you should ask them if they're a fiduciary. If they're not a fiduciary, um, what, what that means is basically by law, if they're a fiduciary, they have to put the client's best interests first above their own. Um, a lot of financial advisors in the big banks like Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, UBS, um, they have to meet what's called the suitability rule. Um, which doesn't necessarily mean that they have to put the client's best interest first, um, which means they can sell product. So you have to be careful into how they're compensated too. You know, some of these terms of financial advisors are loosely thrown around and some financial advisors are compensated off of commissions. Some of them are compensated from mutual funds they put you in. You want to kind of probably stay clear of those because of the fees. Um, the incentives are not properly aligned and, and go more with a fiduciary fee-based advisor um, that charges a, you know, uh, an, either an advisory fee based off of your assets under management. Um, usually you definitely want to make sure that they're charging under 1%. Like I've seen it still that the people are still charging over 1%. Uh, fees are probably the most important thing that's going to make you or break you in the long run. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, the wonderful powers of compound interest, we all know about them, right? Well, the fees work in reverse, they also compound. <laughs> so if someone's charging right. you 1.5 or 2%, um, those fees will start accumulating over time where you'll be astonished as to how much you're paying in fees in the long run. It might not sound like much at the beginning because it's like, oh, 1% or 1.5% extra. Um, but that's a significant amount of money when you need it 20, 30, 40 years from now. Um, huge. So, so I think those are the main things I would look for um, in, a financial, in a financial advisor. And um, and, and I, think, I think something that's overlooked a lot, and again, this is probably because it's one of the best value adds we have, but again, I really do believe that at the end of the day, a financial advisor um, needs to know a lot of, you know, doesn't need to be a hedge fund expert in, on investing, but de- does need to know the theory and the, and the empirical evidence of investing, right? They, they need to be studied on that. And a lot of days today, a lot of financial advisors will sell themselves as passive, you know, I'm just going to buy you low cost index funds, 
But at the end of the day, their, their value add is really on maybe estate planning or financial planning. That's great, but you can get financial planning and estate planning for a flat fee and be done with it, right? Um, the problem is, is that people stay with some financial advisors for a long, 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 long time and their investments are being hampered a lot and not because they're putting them in risky stuff. It's because they're putting them in too conservative things. They're, they're actually, the financial advisor has an incentive actually to not make you a lot of money, but not lose you a lot of money. That way they're still charging, you know, the little percentage points and they can always say that they're smooth and steady. That's a great business model because it's like a Netflix model, right? They can collect the rent. Consistency, over over. yes. But for especially for the younger investors, that is very dangerous because what's going to happen in the long run is you're not going to compound wealth like you should. So a good financial advisor should actually encourage and, and show people how they can take more risks when they when they need to and when they should. And right? when appropriate, right? Exactly. exactly. No, I love that. I again, those that's such a great insight to how to really, again, as Julio stated, are you going to start with an online brokerage firm, just buy into some index funds, or are you going to, again, hire an expert and there is a fee associated with it. But then again, when you think about the payoff and the other value that they're bringing outside of just clicking the, the trade button, you know, that's what's critical there. And so I, guys, I just have to say, thank you so much. We're coming up on our time here, but I wanted to make sure that the listeners know as well. Well, that you guys actually have your own podcast. It's called the Now Know This Podcast. So if you guys haven't heard of it, make sure that you go pull it up, uh, subscribe and start listening because today was just a little taste test, right? Of, uh, or uh, like tapas, because uh, Julio's uh, in Spain. So I had to bring up a, a really good dish there of the information that you'll learn on their podcast. And I will make sure to link it in the show notes as well. Uh, do you guys have anywhere else that the listeners can find you if they have other questions or if they wanted to contact you? Yes, they, they, I have a Twitter account. Uh, my, they can find me as Julio Cacho uh, on Twitter. Um, so I express my thoughts in, in Twitter. They can ask me questions there, but also they can uh, send me an email through our website. So we have a website, uh, which is inscriptioncapital.com. And we also have quantorcapital.com. And I'll make sure to link those in the show notes too, guys. So you can just go and you can click on it. Uh, that'll be easiest if you're, you know, doing laundry or driving in the car, whatever it is, however you listen to your podcasts. Uh, but guys, thank you so much for imparting your wisdom and helping the listeners really feel more confident and knowledgeable when it comes to investing. We tend to overcomplicate this topic because it can be something that's intimidating. But really, as Julio mentioned, you just have to start now. Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. So with that, thank you so much for tuning in today, guys. And if you're not already, make sure you're following us on all the social medias. It's at Financially Free Journey. I post daily tips and motivation to help you on your your financial journey. Until next time. Now, if you love listening to the Financially Free Journey podcast, then you will love our premium subscription edition of the show. You will get early access, ad-free listening, and bonus content that you will not hear on the regular show. So make sure that you hit the subscription button and join the premium fun.